21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. In the basement where? 340? Who shot him? Who? Oh. Is he dead? He's not dead. Who's there? Sergeant Burns there? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, I'll send an ambulance. Emergency squad for what? Who said so? Okay, tell them I'll call CB to send the ESD car. Yeah, right away. Right away. First Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their persons, their homes, and their property is my job. My job and the job of the 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. What makes a city? Not buildings, not subways, not business. People make a city. From dawn to midnight, from midnight to dawn, the rich and the poor and the good and the bad pour their lives together and stir up the city, as in the 21st, even on a quiet night. I was working my 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. tour. At 10, after I had finished reading and signing the reports and communications that had accumulated... I investigated two minor complaints about conditions in the precinct that had been brought to my attention. At midnight, I turned out the platoon for the late tour and went on patrol until shortly after 2 a.m. Then I returned to the station house where Lieutenant Gorman as desk officer and Sergeant Klein were on duty in the muster room. I went around behind the desk to sign an entry in the blotter stating that I had completed patrol and returned to the precinct house. Thank you, Captain. Yeah. Get some coffee hot if you want it. Well, not a bad idea. What's doing? Nothing much, Captain. A hack driver turned in a woman's purse he found in the back of the cab. It had sixty-two dollars and eight cents in it. That's all. Any identification in it? No, sir. Just the money in the small change purse, first first compact, a handkerchief, and a pack of cigarettes. Nothing else. She thought he was a big hero. All right, twenty-nine. I tell him you guys are supposed to look in the back seat of your hacks every time you discharge a passenger. Next time you get sent set down to the hack bureau on a violation. Well, I'll get that coffee. Yes, sir. No, uh, Sergeant. Oh, yes, sir. All right, go ahead, take it off. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. All right, 15. You take your meal period now. All right. Okay? Yes, sir, Captain. I had a communication from the Telegraph Bureau. They're interested in the QD 76 report dated last week. Car jumped the curb and knocked over a call box on Park Avenue. The driver didn't answer the summons in court, and they want to issue a warrant. Will you get it out? Yes, sir, but can I wait a few minutes? What's the trouble? I got a man on post six minutes late ringing in. Who's that? Patrolman Bevan, post number four, Captain. All right, go ahead. Yes, sir. When did he ring in last? 142, Captain, from box number 23, on time to the minute. Communications, Joe, Patrolman Thomas. This is Sergeant Klein, 21st Precinct. Yes, sir. Have 604 to call the 21st. He's not taking his meal, is he? No, sir. He's not due for his meal until 3.30, 3.34. Mm. He's seven minutes late now. What's the trouble? Patrolman Bevan, post number four. He's seven minutes late ringing in. I'm kidding. He's been a good man, Captain. One of the best folks we got in here in that last bunch. Yes, I know. Was he ringing on time earlier? Right on time. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Box 31, Sergeant Burns. Oh, hello. It's Sergeant Burns. Listen, right over to post number four and see if you can locate Bevan. He's eight minutes late ringing in. Bevan? Yeah. I rode by there about 20, 25 minutes ago. I saw him on post. Did you stop and talk to him? Yeah. You didn't give him any calls, did you? No, not a thing from here. Okay, I'll get back to you. Well, he said he rode by there about 20, 25 minutes ago and saw him. Is he riding over there now? Yes, sir. He's a good kid, that Bevan. His father was a lieutenant in Brooklyn East Borough headquarters. He retired a year or so ago. Do you know him, Captain? No, no. You get out that QD-76, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I don't know. He's in the drawer, Captain. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. What? 
Well, who is it that stabbed? Who? Speak into the phone. I went into the 124 room and had What's a cup of coffee. Address? Patrolman Ryan, the clerical man, Where? called to my attention an MV-104A report concerning an accident on Franklin D. Roosevelt Drive along the East River, which had occurred during the day tour. A passenger in one of the cars involved had died of injuries in Mount Sinai Hospital at 1.50 a.m. I instructed him to have the desk officer notify the communications bureau and the Manhattan East Motor Vehicle Homicide Squad. I went back to my office to read and sign more reports to be sent to the 6th Division Headquarters, 160 East 35th Street. At 2.35 a.m., Sergeant Klein walked across the muster room and stuck his head in the open door of my office. Captain. Come in. Sergeant Burns just rang in. Yes? He's been over every inch of post number four. He can't find any sign of Bennett. Where'd he look? Just on the street? Well, so far, Captain. That's all he had time for. All right. Come on. Oh, uh, call the sector car from over there. Yes. Have him drop his recorder on post number four and bring the car by here for me. Yes. Beginning not to make sense, Captain. No sense at all. Communications Bureau, Patrolman Thomas. Sergeant Klein, 21st Precinct. Have 608. Call the 21st, will you? Yes, sir. 608. Right away. All right. Let's take a look at the map, Sergeant. That's a pretty quiet post normally, Captain. Yeah. There's not much open around there this time of night. Three or four bars and grills, maybe. Long night lunch in that. There's another lunch in that here. It's open all night. That's real crazy, the whole thing. What time was Bevan due to ring in last? 2.12, Captain. He's almost a half hour late. I stood behind the desk for a few minutes and watched as two robbery assault and Section 1897 suspects were brought down by Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, for booking. The sector car came and Patrolman Farrell drove me to post number four. We located Sergeant Burns. He already had his operator, Patrolman Mercado, and Patrolman Eisman on the job, making a building-by-building -building search for Patrolman Bevan. Post number four consists of three square blocks between First and Second Avenues. As in many parts of New York, the complexion of the streets change from building to building. An old law tenement might be flanked by a fine apartment house on one side and a garage on the other. We shook every door, went in every basement, inspected every courtyard, and climbed every roof. In this, we had assistance from the men on the Jason Post, from the men on the ESD car patrolling the district, and from Lieutenant King and two of his detectives of the 21st Squad. By 3.18 a.m., there was still no sign of Patrolman Bevan. Beats me, Captain. Just beats the living daylights out of me. Yeah. Bevan was the kind of a guy that... Wait a minute. <clears throat> There's somebody walking. Where, Captain? Okay. Oh, yeah. Hey, mister. Mister, wait a minute. We want to talk to you. Oh, no, no, no. Have you been around here for the last hour? Uh, look, I'm so mad. It's too biz. That's all. It's too biz. You can't kill a man over two beers, can you? What's your name? My name, uh, my name is Joseph Lance Baldwin Jr. Jr. because I was named after my father. had the same name, only senior. Two beers, that's all. Look, uh, have you seen a policeman around here tonight? A policeman? Yeah, I've seen a cop around here. When? Right now, him. He's a cop. And, oh, look, the sergeant, too. Uh, two beer sergeant. You got my word of honor, my scout father. Where do you live? Joseph Lawrence Bolney, Jr. Two beers. No, no, you told us your name. Where do you live? There, right there. I almost made it, too, didn't I? Almost. Hey, listen. You won't tell Alma. Please don't tell Alma. All right, come along. <laughs> Take me to jail, lock me up, and throw the two bears away, but don't tell Alma. Come along. That's all I have. You can ask anybody. Is uh, this the house? Yeah, this is it. 728. 728. Apartment 6B. You're not going to tell Alma. Got the keys? I think so. I think I got my keys, but please don't tell Alma. Uh, we'll let you tell her yourself. You make the stand? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, good night, gentlemen. Good night. It was a pleasure to have found with you. Oh, there's Matt King. Captain. Hello, Matt. We found him, Captain. Where? The next block in the basement of a tenement, 740. He was shot. How bad? He's not dead, but it's pretty bad. With a jaw and neck on the right side. Is he conscious? No, he lost a lot of blood. 
Even if he was conscious, I don't think he'd be able to talk. That's the ambulance, I guess. Who shot him? You had any idea? Yes, sir. Who? It looks like he shot himself. Lieutenant King drove us around to the house. It was an old law tenement building. The ambulance and the sector car were parked in front. It was 3.31 a.m. There was no crowd on the sidewalk, but tenants in night clothes were beginning to stick their heads out of the front windows. The first floor above the street was occupied by two business establishments, a beauty parlor and a radio repair shop. An iron gate and fence separated the basement stairs from the sidewalk. We went down. Go ahead, Captain. Basement's been vacant for about a year. Yeah. Be right with you, Captain. Whitey. All right. All right. Be careful now. Yeah. Roll him on the stretcher. Just roll him on. All right. Get a feet there. Okay. I got them. Easy now. Easy. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Doctor, I'm Captain Kennelly. Captain? How does it look? It went through the maxillary bone of the jaw, Captain. On the way, it probably hit a vein in the neck. Lost a lot of blood. How is he? Pretty bad. Did he shoot himself? The gun was fired at very close range, Captain. Not farther than this. His face and head are full of powder marks. I see. All right. Easy with him. All right. Look together now. Now. Come on, lift. This way. Watch it. You've got very little clearance there. Easy. Easy. What's the turn there? That's it. Pull that back end high going up. Come on. Captain. Yes, Matt? Why do you know Novak have been talking to his tenants? Yes, they can't find anybody who heard the shot. The next floor up the stores, and the flats don't start until the second floor. Only one shot? Are you sure? That's all that was fired from a service gun, Captain. Is it possible he chased someone down here? Is it possible they had a gun and shot him? Uh, yes, sir, it's possible. But not likely. No, sir. That shot was fired at very close range. There isn't any sign of another person being down here. Is that his flashlight there? Yeah. We're leaving it lay there for a while till we get some measurements. Was it turned on? It was on, Captain. The switch, that is. The light was broken when it dropped, apparently. The gun was on the floor right near him. How old is he, Captain? He's on his way, Captain. How old is he, Sergeant? 24, 25. Mm -hmm. Married? Yeah. Yeah, he's married. A couple of young kids. Do you have any personal problems that you know of? Not that I know of, Lieutenant. You never spoke to me about any personal problems, man. Well, he's got a big personal problem now. Yes, he has. If he lives. I waited around the scene for a few more minutes while Lieutenant King and his detectives continued their investigation and Sergeant Burns talked to Lieutenant Gorman and got information for his UF-6. He ordered the sector cars to resume patrol and released the ESD car to its regular duties. From a call box on the corner, I gave instructions to the desk officer to notify the division command regarding the occurrence. He told me that according to Patrolman Bevan's records, he resided in Jackson Heights, Queens. His wife's name, Marion. I instructed Lieutenant Gorman to call CB with a request that the 110th Precinct notify Patrolman Bevan was wounded and in Bellevue Hospital. Otherwise, things were still quiet in the precinct. Patrolman Mercado was assigned to post number four. Patrolman Farrell drove me downtown to Bellevue. I waited in the doctor's lounge for the surgeon. Dr. Lowfield? Yes, I'm Dr. Lowfield. Captain Kennelly, 21st Precinct. Good man. Oh, oh, yes, Captain. Well, uh, what kind of a chance do you think he had? A uh, fair, Captain, just fair. No better than that? Well, we tried to probe around in there when he came into emergency. We couldn't reach the slug. It's pretty deep. There's no telling where it went after it penetrated or what organs it hit. I sent him up to be x-rayed. That'll locate the slug, and I'll go in after it. Well, does it have to come out now? The sooner the better, Captain. What does surgery do to his chances, Captain? Well, he's apparently a very healthy young man, physically. Under the circumstances, his pulse and respiration are both better than can be expected. I see. Does it uh, appear to you that he shot himself? The gun was fired at very close range. Powder mark? That's right, yes, sir. He uh, has a family, doesn't he? Yes, his wife's been notified. She's on her way. She'll be here any minute. Uh, I'll have to talk to her and explain what I plan to do. I'll need her consent. No, I don't think there'll be any trouble about that, Doctor. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Dr. Lowfield? Yes, Captain. Yes, Captain. All right. 
Right there. Yes, we'll be out. Thank you. Mrs. Bevan. She's waiting out at the reception desk. All right. That way, Captain. Thank you. This is the worst part of my job, Captain. Not the best part of mine. Mm. That's her, I guess. I'll talk to her. Mrs. Bevan? Yes. I'm Captain Kennelly. How, oh, Joe, where is he? Well, this is Dr. Lowfield. He's dead, isn't he? That's what you're going to tell me. No, no, he's not dead. You sure? You positive? I just left him. Uh, you'd better sit down, Mrs. Bevan. That's all right. Please, sit down. Really the worst thing in the world. We're going to have to operate. Right away? Yes, right away. If it's got to be done. I suppose it's all right, isn't it, Captain? Yes, it has to be done. All right. Well? Doctor? Yeah? Can I see him? Before, I mean. I don't think it would be wise, Mrs. Bevan. Oh. Well, I have to get up to him. Yes, that would be a good idea. I'll be back down as soon as possible. As soon as possible. What was his name? Dr. Who? Dr. Lowfield. Is he good? Fine as they come. That's good. It's awful. Worst thing in the world. Joe would come home and tell me about notifications. He'd tell me how I'd have to find a mother or a wife or a father and tell them that someone was hurt or, or dead. He'd tell me how he'd always get a neighbor who knew the person he had to notify, and then, then the, the doorbell rang, and there was Mrs. Petey from next door, and then Mr. Tom, and I, I, I screamed. I, I, I really screamed. I, I just I don't know what to do. I know, Mrs. Bevan. I knew what they were going to say. They were, they were nice, very nice, but, but he didn't know anything. Just, just that he was shot and that he was here. He didn't know how or why or how bad or anything. Make it worse, the kids woke up. Or one of them, Jackie, I think. Mrs. Creedy's staying with them. But she's glad her husband isn't a cop. He's a salesman or something. Very nice people. I'm sure they are. But the captain, you've got to tell me how bad is Joe. He's going to die. I, I don't know what I'd do. He's in serious condition, Mr. Dunn. Serious God. Has he had any problems lately? Real problems? What do you mean? Well, I mean, have you had any financial difficulties? Any trouble at home? Why? Have you? Well, we managed. How about you and George? What do you mean? Well, is it getting along all right? It's been fine. We're very happy. We have a nice home. Two very beautiful children. We couldn't be happier. I'm glad to hear that. What do you want to know for? Oh, we just have to know everything. How did you get shot, Captain? Who did it? Do you know? Well, not exactly, Mrs. Bevan. We we have an idea. We're trying to make sure. I waited with Mrs. Bevan for another 15 or 20 minutes until her mother arrived from Brooklyn. The operation had not yet been completed. I arrived back at the precinct house at 5.14 a.m. Master room was quiet. Hello, Ken. How was it, Captain? Well, not too good. They hadn't brought him downstairs yet when I left. That can be a rough operation, I guess. Yeah. What's doing around here? Nothing new, Captain. All right, 31. Hello, Captain. Any messages, Sergeant? Just division headquarters. The division captain wants you to call if there's any change in Bevan's condition. You needn't bother unless there's a change. Okay. Hasn't been a change, has it? No. Still critical. Beats me. Sure beats me. Here's some hot coffee, Captain. No, thanks. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Captain Canelli there. So who is this calling, please? Dr. Lowfield of Bellevue. It's important. Hold on, please. Captain, Dr. Lowfield of Bellevue. All right, I'll take it here. 
Captain Kennelly. Dr. Lowfield, Captain. Yes, Doctor. I finished the operation. I think he's going to be all right. Good. That's good news. The bullet was large in the buccinator muscle on the contralateral side of the mouth. I got it out. He has a fractured jawbone, which I set, and he lost a lot of blood. So I think he'll pull out of it all right. He's not conscious, is he, Doctor? No, no, he isn't. Listen, Captain. Yes? Do all your men carry a standard service revolver? What do you mean? In uniform, the men are required to carry a thirty-eight special. Why? Is that what Patrolman Bevan had? Yes. What's your point? Well, uh, the slug I took out of him was a little beat up, but uh, it doesn't look like a thirty-eight to me. Doesn't it? I'm no expert on guns, but, well, I used to fool around with him a little bit in the Army. It looks more like a thirty-two than a thirty-eight, Captain. Where is this slug? Well, I'm... I'm holding it, Captain. A detective from your precinct asked me to. Lieutenant King? to it, Doctor. Just hang on to it. I will. I intend to. And thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye, Doctor. Any change in his condition, Captain? There have been all kinds of changes. I'm going upstairs to see Lieutenant King. I went through the back room and upstairs to see Lieutenant Matt King. He telephoned to Dr. Lowfield. Detective Vitale was sent down to Bellevue to get the slug taken from Patrolman Bevan's jaw and take it to the police laboratory for a ballistics examination, along with Patrolman Bevan's service revolver. If the slug was fired from a 32 caliber gun, Patrolman Bevan could not have shot himself. By 8 a.m., there was no word on the ballistics examination. I turned out the platoon for the day tour, signed the blotter, and left the precinct to go off duty. Ellen was awake and dressed when I got home. I talked with her while she had breakfast. She told me she was going to 34th Street because both Macy's and Gimbel's had advertised big linen sales. Ellen left the house and I went to bed. A hot sun flashed in under the shade. I don't know how long it took me to fall asleep. Maybe it only seemed long. Will you let the man on TS know so he can call me? I'll call you myself, Captain, as soon as I know anything. I got up and got dressed. After I had some coffee, I took my car over to Fred's to be washed and greased. I returned home close to four. Ellen was there. She told me Lieutenant King had phoned. I called him back. The man arrested in the 34th had a record of five arrests and two convictions for burglary. After questioning by Lieutenant King and Assistant District Attorney Lewis Sullent, he admitted shooting Patrolman Bevan. He was brought into the 21st and booked on charges of assault in Section 1897. The gun in his possession at the time of his arrest was sent to the police laboratory for ballistics examination to corroborate his statement. That night, en route to a meeting of the Captain's Endowment Association at the 71st Regiment Armory in Manhattan, I stopped in at Bellevue Hospital. Oh, hello, Captain. How is he, Mrs. Bevan? Very much better. Well, that's good. He's been propped up since about 4 o'clock this afternoon. Of course, he can't talk, and it's hard to feed him much, but the doctor says he's doing fine, just fine. Uh, I was going out now so he could get some food. Well, then I won't stay. I oh, was that's just... all right. He's not asleep yet. I'm sure he'd want to see you. It, it, it's this way. Have you been here since this morning? Oh, yes. My mother was here for a while, and then she went out to the house to take care of the kids. Miss mm-hmm. Creedy couldn't stay all day. She had children of her own, you know. Uh, it's in here. Let me stick my head in and make sure he's not asleep. Joe? He's still up. Come on in. Guess who's here, Joe? Captain Kennelly. Hello, Joe. The doctor told me it'd be at least a week before he'd be able to talk again. You know, it was real funny. The detectives in the precinct, what were their names, Joe? Kinney and Goldman? 
Jimmy and Goldman, they came down here one statement from Joe on what happened. Do you know them, Captain? Oh, yes. Yeah. But it was really funny, wasn't it, Joe? He, he couldn't say a word to them. It, it was all all right anyway, because they knew what happened from the man that shot him. Uh, Joe saw him come down a fire escape. He, he chased him. He chased him into that basement. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that right, Joe? Well, he, he just robbed an apartment. Anyway, Joe followed him down into the basement. He was looking around for him with his flashlight, and the man was hiding behind a partition. And then when Joe got this close, he shot. Joe fired one shot, but didn't do any good. Isn't that right, Joe? And they, we're glad they got him. Very glad. We're glad Joe's going to be all right. I was worried this morning, Captain. So was I. I didn't know how things were going to turn out. I thought he was dead or dying. But look at him. Strong as an ox. And... Well, maybe it's a good thing to keep in mind, Mrs. Bevan, for all of us. Things can look a lot different than they really are. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Klein. I can hear you. What's the trouble there? You all alone? How much is on the clock? Two dollars and what? Why can't you pay it? Where'd she lose it? Where? Doesn't she have any money? Nothing. Well, all right. You're driving a hack. Drive her into the station house. We'll talk about it when you get here. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. Police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry go round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking.